Hey, th thanks everyone. Um, very nice to, to be here. Uh, I think I first came down here in the early 1990s, it's hard to imagine. Uh, I found, a, oh, this is my, my talk. You'll hear what I, I'll explain what I mean by the, the, the title in a minute. But uh, I, I found this uh, thing online. You have a wonderful web uh, archive of materials. Uh, I was uh, working with Ken Kennedy uh, in the Center for Research on Parallel Computing, and when that ended, uh, he and a number of us, we proposed the Center for Grid Application Development Software, I think it was called, CGRADS, and I was in this hall like uh, 22 years ago. Um, I, I, everyone, I suppose I should tell a Ken Kennedy story just to get started. So when I was just a young postdoc or assistant scientist, I, was, I gave a talk at a meeting Ken was at, and I, immediately after the talk, the talk, he ran up to me and, to ask me a question. And what was his question? It was, what font were you using on your, on your slides? So he was, I guess I had a keen eye for, for fonts, although the choice of font here doesn't seem very, uh, what is it, Comic Sans or something? Doesn't seem very modern nowadays. Um, but uh, I, I put this up also just to, to uh, communicate why I'm giving a talk here in, in a, what I think of still as a center for high performance computing. Um, you know, we, I've always been interested in the question of how do we allow uh, computation to extend beyond the boundaries of a single machine. Um, and uh, I'll talk today about some of the work we've done in that area over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, back then, we were trying to uh, allow things like, well, this was a, we were very pleased back then with this uh, application that would allow a high-performance computing uh, program running at one site to uh, uh, detect a uh, quality of service uh, violation and, and then migrate to another computer on another uh, center. And that seemed to us to be very uh, special, although it took a lot of work. And, over the last 20 years, we've got to the point where it's now fairly trivial, as, as I'll explain. Anyway, so computing over in a distributed fashion. Why, why, my, why might we be interested in that? Um, so I'll give a few examples to start with. Um, one uh, system that we've built over some years and now uh, run at Argonne and other national labs is a thing called the Earth System Grid Federation that uh, collects data from the uh, international intergovernmental panel on climate change's uh, intercomparison project uh, and uh, allows people to compare the results of climate simulations uh, from, uh, from dozens of centers around the world, actually 100 models from more than 20 uh, countries. Um, when we started doing this, all the data was moved to a single location for intercomparison. Now individual data sets can be uh, you know, many, many terabytes, and so it becomes a distributed computing problem to understand what the different models say about climate change. Uh, another very different example, um, a project led by my colleague Arvind Ramanathan, is uh, interested in detecting uh, pathogen variants, variants of things like uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, by uh, monitoring data coming in from the field uh, and then looking at the new uh, variants that may appear and deciding whether they are variants of concern before we have time to, to test them. And he does this by very modern training foundation models on large numbers of viral sequences. Uh, and then in the sort of phase space of the foundation model, looking whether the viral sequences are going into previously unvisited uh, parts. And that involves data streaming in from many places, large scale HPC computations, and many other uh, activities. Um, third example, one that uh, I've spent a lot of time on in the last uh, decade or so, although actually we started this back in the time of the Center for Research on Parallel Computing, which uh, Ken Kennedy led, um, understanding how to uh, take modern scientific instruments and allow them to uh, uh, respond rapidly, very rapidly, to uh, changes in observed uh, signals. And, I show here an example involving the, a, uh, a detector at the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center's uh, synchrotron light source. Um, they, uh, it's, you can analyze the data as it's obtained, but it takes a very long time. So instead what they do is they train a neural network that can quickly detect interesting events. 
Retraining that locally takes uh, 20 minutes or so, which is impractical. So instead, they, uh, what we do with, for them now is we send it across the, the data across the country, uh, retrain it on an AI supercomputer called a Cerebrus, which we can do in 20 seconds, and send the results back to accelerate uh, the, the, uh, the, the detection of interesting events and then potentially the experiment steering. I think I'll skip the next one. Um, so all of these applications uh, you know, probably seem on the surface to be fairly straightforward. We're going to compute in one place, analyze data elsewhere, maybe compute in many places, um, perhaps uh, move my computation from one place to another. But they all uh, have this common challenge of involving the or requiring the integration of distributed resources that are uh, located in different uh, institutions, states, countries, whatever, um, uh, and require the movement of data, access to computation, uh, t things that in result in or encounter many sources of, of friction, we might call it. So what are these sources of friction? Um, well, first of all, I would say, in contrary to uh, maybe 20 years ago, telecommunications is no longer the problem. Um, it's uh, well, you know, thanks to amazing work by uh, uh, networking uh, scientists, network engineers, and people who build networks, you know, we can now get hundreds of gigabits per second of network to many parts of the scientific uh, environment in which we, we live, not everywhere, of course. Um, ESnet 6 uh, is the energy sciences network that I recently uh, participated in the launch of. You know, they've now got 400 gigabit networks linking many of the the national labs and a growing number of other institutions. Um, and yet more interestingly, perhaps, uh, you know, we're moving to a, a time, I think, where uh, the traditional barriers of requiring physical network connectivity to uh, remote locations is going to be, become less important, um, thanks to things like 5G networks, 6G networks, and uh, free space uh, optics. Um, I won't say more about that, I guess, given time, but it's a, it's a you know, the sooner you'll be at the point where wherever you want communications, unless you're underground perhaps somewhere or, well, that's, maybe that's the only place that you can possibly be, you'll be able to get very high speed reliable network connectivity. And in this, uh, so let's see, this, um, can I point with this? I think so. This is an interesting, uh, there's a company, uh, Illyria, who's building out this uh, system for uh, deploying communication computing communication routes uh, basically to anywhere on the planet. They call it uh, initially the Minkowski platform. Does anyone here know who Minkowski was? Someone does, I'm sure. Yes, of course you do. So, so uh, he was a, uh, you know, an early interpreter, popularizer, uh, collaborator of Einstein. You know, and, and he uh, commented that, you know, that we're moving to the point where we live in a space-time continuum where you know, space and time are sort of become sort of interchangeable. You know, so in a sense, I, I think we're getting to the same point for computation. Computation and location are sort of interchangeable. If you, you can compute somewhere far away, maybe a little bit faster, or maybe compute locally more slowly, and you can interchange those two, uh, two ways of solving a problem depending on what your particular uh, constraints are. So anyway, but we face these sources of friction, which is the a lot of where um, I and my colleagues spend our time. Um, so, the, so let's, we can break down the things that we want to be able to do into just three things, and each has various challenges. So we want to be able to act on resources, storage systems, computers, robots, uh, whatever, regardless of where they're located and what specific, purely a local interface uh, they might um, uh, need to uh, use to access them. And there's all sorts of mundane issues that we face relating to interfaces and behaviors that vary in odd ways, reliability issues, security, and so forth. Uh, we want to be able to execute those, low, those remote actions reliably, um, you know, which means that they, we should be able to, in most cases, make them occur regardless of the various forms of transient uh, failure. Um, and then we have to be able to do it securely, um, which in a general sense means we want to be able to manage and control who's allowed to do what actions, when and where, um, so that 
you know, we enable people or programs acting on their behalf to do things at remote locations, but others cannot take advantage of that. Uh, the flexibility that we've introduced by allowing that to do things that we don't want to happen at particular times or, or locations. And of course, there's all sorts of mundane and in some cases more profound issues that are, arise in, in that case. So we've spent a lot of time. Uh, we had our first little prototypes of this 20 years ago. Now we can do it on routinely on a global scale, uh, developing solutions to these problems. So let's go through them uh, briefly. So the first one, acting anywhere. And of course, there's people have worked on this for at least five decades, I suppose. The early ARPANET was designed to uh, uh, enable remote computing. Uh, that was its initial motivation, although it ended up being used for much uh, else. Um, but we can trace back a long history of mechanisms for remote uh, data actions and remote compute actions and remote other sorts of actions. Uh, each works well in some situations but faces problems, some of which I list, uh, list here. Um, what we've uh, done over the last uh, decade or more is, is develop some very simple mechanisms that allow for local deployment of agents that support remote compute and remote data actions and that can easily be retargeted to different underlying storage and compute platforms. And these systems are called Globus Connect agents and Globus Compute agents. And I won't say too much about their uh, internals, but um, you know, typical uh, li lightweight deployment uh, mechanisms, simple interfaces, adapters that allow, allow us to uh, integrate with a wide variety of underlying systems. Sort of what you'd expect to see, but you know, well, well engineered. Uh, the next uh, issue, which is maybe a little bit more innovative, is dealing with the question of how we ensure reliable execution of sets of actions. So someone wants to process data at 100 uh, climate data sites. They want to uh, perhaps distribute a computation over multiple sites. How do you ensure reliability? So there are well-known techniques, of course, uh, you know, two-phase commit, retry, uh, exponential back-offs and, and so forth we can use for these things. Uh, but they all tend to be difficult to implement when you're doing it in a single layer system where every entity is potentially subject to failure. What we've uh, found to be very effective is to use basically a two-layer hierarchical system in which we run hosted research supervision services in public cloud like Amazon or Google uh, with all of the wonderful support they provide for replication, um, uh, distributed state, and so on. Uh, use that to manage the state of the compute of our activities and, and then deploy the activities onto uh, underlying resources by sending messages to these compute or storage or other, other agents. Uh, and then we can then use this sort of underlying uh, research supervision fabric hosted on the cloud to run things like reliable data transfer, uh, reliable catalogs, reliable computational structures, uh, scientific instrument control, and other things uh, like that. Yeah? Yes, well, that's an interesting question. So uh, in moving, uh, so the question is if we, uh, does, does this help with data privacy, security, sovereignty? Uh, so it, it does two things. First of all, uh, well, the fact that you've got some state in the cloud potentially introduces uh, additional security risks. You know, if I say, please move this data from here to here, and I send that request to here, now potentially someone could uh, intercept that message uh, and uh, you know, maybe replay it in some incorrect manner. Um, you know, while if I move the data myself directly from here, perhaps that risk wouldn't exist. So we've spent a lot of time working to ensure that those risks don't uh, cause, lead to challenges, and also um, uh, and, and also ensuring that you know, private data doesn't end up in, in the cloud hosting system. So lots of time spent with NIH and other uh, policy people to ensure that these things can occur uh, correctly. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that you've got this centrally hosted 
managed or supervision service does allow you to enforce policies that might be otherwise hard to, to enforce because uh, data always passes via this professionally managed uh, service. So for the most part, I think it increases rather than decreases uh, security. And then, so then that comes in, that brings us up to the third thing we want to be able to do, which is control who can perform what actions, uh, when and where. So you know, computer security, of course, has advanced tremendously in the last uh, several uh, decades, but mostly it's still focused on ensuring that a person or maybe a program is who they say they are and that they are allowed to perform an action at some remote location. Um, some of the challenges we face here is we want to allow for actions that may occur at many locations and also allow for dynamic behaviors and for agents that act on people's behalf. So therefore we need the ability not just to verify someone's identity but to delegate uh, the right to perform a task on, on, on the behalf of the person who made the initial request. And that leads us to our, uh, um, the so-called Globus Auth trust, trust Fabric, which addresses these issues of managed delegation of privileges so that I can start a program and say this program is allowed to uh, you know, perhaps uh, access data within the Earth System Grid Federation that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's got the right to perhaps read the data but not write the data, uh, or perhaps it's got the right to use certain computers but not other computers, and then we can verify that those uh, delegated rights are enforced uh, correctly. So here's a little, uh, maybe too complicated, we'll see, but uh, animation of what goes on under the covers uh, when we're using these, these mechanisms. So. Uh, so we want to be able to say, who do I trust to act on my behalf, when, for what purpose? We've got nice mechanisms like OAuth and such like for negotiating many of the uh, exchanges. And then we introduce on top of that mechanisms that allow us to, the user to first of all specify, here's a flow, a set of actions that I want to be perf performed on my behalf, and here's a consent um, that I give it to uh, perform certain things. Um, and then as we proceed through the various steps of the computation, uh, there's a, a series of protocol exchanges that ensure, ensure that uh, at every step we have the access tokens to perform a particular task. So I'm going to get an to access token to perform a computation. Um, I then give uh, pass that token to another hosted service that's going to run that computation on my behalf. We then uh, get additional tokens that uh, allow us to run a function on a particular computer, pass that through, and eventually we're able to run the required computation there, but not, not somewhere else, and no one else can intercept those tokens and use them for other purposes. So it probably looks sort of complicated, but the wonderful thing is this now actually runs at scale, and we've, like as I said, this is a somewhat old slide, but more than a billion access tokens have been issued uh, at, at this point. Um, so, to summarize the set of services that we've constructed to uh, operate, to address these three sources of fr friction, so we've got these local agents that we deploy anywhere we can or want to. Um, they provide a global footprint for performing actions. We've got this managed research acceleration services that allow us to buffer against and re recover from various failures. Uh, and then we've got this concept of delegation implemented in a very flexible and robust manner so we can manage who does what where. And if you can't, I encourage you to look at this wonderful little cartoon I found online. You see it's uh, Sisyphus uh, who's delegated pushing a rock up a hill to a robot, uh, which appealed to me. So um, that would perhaps go better with this action here, actually, but it, it seemed to fit in well there. So, OK, so that's, uh, these are, that's what the three mechanisms we've developed over you know, a decade or more. Uh, now let's look at how they're actually deployed and, and used. Um, so first of all, uh, so we've implemented these things, and actually uh, 
persuaded the University of Chicago that it's a good thing for the, for the community that these services uh, exist. And so now we have a unit at the University of Chicago who, op who operates the Globus platform for the research community. It's uh, not thanks to the generosity of the university. They are happy to host us, but the service is supported by many subscribing institutions, including Rice University. Uh, has more than 400,000 registered users, um, used in actually 150 countries, last I looked. Um, there are 58,000 storage systems around the world that have these little Globus agents sitting on them, plus many other laptops and other similar systems. Uh, and it's used to move huge amounts of data every day and to do increasingly large amounts of computation. Um, so I guess one thing one could say about this is it's, this is something that started under the Ken Kennedy's Center for Research on Parallel Computing. It was sort of this nutty uh, idea of a few of us that led into the CGRAD proposal, and then now, 20 years later, it's, been, it's really an essential part of national or international research infrastructure for, for, for many, many people. But how do people use it in practice? So let's give a few examples. Um, so this is, uh, does anyone here, is anyone here a user of the advanced photon source? Uh, perhaps not, wrong crowd. Uh, this is a synchrotron light source, a fascinating uh, facility. Um, actually was first built and launched at about the same time that the Center for Research on Parallel Computing was launched, I think. It basically, uh, you know, they, it's, they, it's a sort of an accelerator thing. They rotate uh, particles um, around this, uh, the electrons are around this uh, beam and they keep bending the beam and every time you bend the beam you get very bright synchrotron radiation coming out. So you have lots of beam lines where people do things like stick proteins that they want to find the structure of or materials that they want to image the internal internals of and, and so forth. Um, so scientifically interesting. It also generates vast amounts of data. So when we first when it first launched, people would come in with their floppy disks, then their DVD drives, and now they might bring their USB stick. But increasingly, they don't carry their data at all because every, essentially every beamline has got a Globus endpoint on it. Um, and so their data is automatically routed to a computer or to their home institution. Um, so it shows the impact that these simple mechanisms uh, can have. A growing number of systems also now run these Globus compute endpoints, which allow you to do remote computing, so you can do analysis of data as it's being collected, rather than taking it home with you. So let me say a few words about that. I think that might be next. Yes, so uh, Globus compute, really the, the work of one of my colleagues, Kyle Chard, uh, although Zhu Zhao Li is the first author on this paper, so he's mentioned here. Um, it's a uh, in a sense, a realization of the function as a service model, um, but for a distributed, federated environment. So those of you who are, probably some of you are familiar with function as a service, which is the sort of a step forward from the early days of cloud computing. The first days, well, early days of cloud computing, you, would, you could run a virtual machine on a remote computer. And that was, of course, liberating in many ways, but not very flexible. Uh, Function as a service lets you run a arbitrary function uh, on, a, on a computer hosted by some cloud provider. Um, and that function, you could think of it, say, as a Python or a C++ procedure that runs there and then returns a result. And of course, the wonderful thing about it is you don't need to uh, know anything about computers, really, or how to provision computers or how to configure them in order to run your function at some remote location. So Globus Compute, we used to call it FunkX, um, basically takes that model but allows you, says instead of running your function in some cloud somewhere, you can run it on any computer that runs one of these Globus Compute agents with this cloud-hosted management service sitting uh, uh, on the cloud to keep track of what function calls are sent where and, and whether they succeed or not. So if we'd had this 20 years ago, that thing, all the things we were going to do in CGRADS would have been fairly trivial. But of course, we didn't have them uh, back then. And, but anyway, so under the covers, what does it look like uh, 
just a little bit of code. So on my laptop or my supercomputer or my cluster, I install, configure a Globus compute endpoint somewhere where functions can run. Um, someone else comes along and uh, registers a function that can run on that endpoint. Not very interesting names, but this is the function f. Could be something more interesting, like alpha fold or uh, such, some, some such thing. And then another, uh, and then you know, in people's programs, they can repeatedly run a function. Say, so run this function um, on this endpoint, passing in this argument. And that will run. I could run another function on a different endpoint or a different argument. Um, and the whole, uh, thanks to the power of now our ubiquitous, fairly reliable, high-speed internet fabric and our Globus uh, fabric, we can then run things without any uh, further uh, uh, intervention or complexities. And you can do that with fairly, depending on what you're running, you know, modest latencies. Oh, here, so, so some things that people are doing with this Globus compute fabric. Um, here's uh, one of my colleagues, Ravi Maduri, and a number of others at the University of Illinois and elsewhere are using it for uh, things like privacy pre pre preserving learning, uh, federated learning. Um, so we're probably all familiar with federated learning. You know, you try and train machine learning models uh, on large amounts of data, but you don't, you do that in a way that the data does not need to move uh, into a central location. So in principle, if done rightly, uh, it you can learn models over large amounts of data without revealing the details of the data that you're learning on. And this is of great interest. For example, uh, for um, medical uh, imaging. So actually, this is Mary Ellen Geiger, who is a, a radiologist who has been doing this for a, a long time in central locations. And uh, you know, they've, they've been able to build fairly quickly this federated system that allows federated learning over data stores in, uh, actually, I think it's a globe, on a global scale. I think there's some there in Norway somewhere. I can't remember. Yeah, Norway, Illinois, et cetera, et cetera. OK, um, another more sort of conventional HPC thing, high performance computing thing is, uh, but also with a medical uh, uh, orientation, is running large drug screening computations, which, of course, have emerged as one of the big, uh, interesting problems for uh, high performance computing. Uh, you want to uh, screen large numbers of uh, small molecules as potential uh, drug candidates. Um, and uh, you do that by running uh, various forms of computation. It could be simple molecular dynamics computations or even machine learned uh, approximations to that, or it could be more complex quantum uh, mechanical calculations. And you want to schedule those computations based on uh, what you're learning over time as you look at more and more uh, interesting molecules. So there's a group in China that's uh, running such a thing across a whole range of computers, mostly in China, I think, actually, um, using the Funkex uh, Globus Compute uh, platform. OK, so that's, uh, we've looked quickly at cloud-hosted what we call Globus Transfer. We can move data anywhere, move a single file or petabytes uh, of data. Globus Compute that lets us run functions anywhere. Uh, the next uh, service I'll just say a few words about is what we call Globus Flows, which basically hosts, uh, um, hosts management logic for running sequences of operations. Um, so I think this is you know, the sort of thing you might want to be able to say, I, every time I get some data at a scientific instrument, I want to move it to a computing system to analyze it and then archive it in a institutional storage system. So this is something that you know, some universities, every scientific instrument basically wants to be able to do as data is, is collected. Um, and we want to be able to do that, of course, reliably, um, securely, uh, and uh, on any instrument in every computer, the three things that we started off saying were the sources of friction that we've been seeking to, to automate. So Globus Flows lets us uh, do that. Um, and so, for example, uh, this example that I gave earlier is now uh, implemented as a, actually a somewhat more complex flow than shown here, but you can see uh, 
we're transferring data to, uh, the, from the instrument to our uh, AI computer. Uh, we're doing some computing uh, to prepare the data. We're doing more computing to train the machine learning model, and then we're transferring the, the uh, hey Leonard, hi, uh, the um, the uh, transformed uh, the trained model back to back to uh, back to uh, the Stanford Stanford in this case. So uh, we're actually uh, finding once you put these mechanisms in the hands of uh, of, of uh, scientists or biomedical people that they. Uh, get very excited and start implementing all sorts of flows. So these are all flows that have been implemented uh, at, for use at the advanced photon source, the circular thing I showed you earlier. And uh, well, nothing too much to show here, except some of them can get uh, quite uh, complicated. Uh, each of these corresponds to a different imaging modality uh, at, this, at this facility. OK. Uh, oh, yes, and so uh, and, uh, Lots of interesting things going on here under the covers. Uh, it's, uh, perhaps this is mostly interesting to people who run computing centers, but uh, once you put these flows uh, in place, um, you get new applications that create entirely new computing workloads for uh, the computing centers that have to host them. So here I'm showing the, uh, you know, the, the breaks down uh, in time uh, between different activities for uh, these seven different uh, instrument data analysis flows that I mentioned. So you can see some involve very large computations, you know, running for tens of minutes, others uh, uh, millisecond or a few second computations. Um, we need to find ways to schedule all of these uh, uh, effectively. So this would have been a wonderful problem for the CGRAD center that I was talking about uh, uh, earlier. Okay, so. Uh, Let's see, what do we, uh, well, what I wanted to, so I referred earlier to this notion of the, uh, I think I quoted Minkowski speaking about um, a, uh, a space-time continuum um, and, uh, you know, in which time and space are sort of interchangeable um, in, the, in the world of uh, uh, general relativity uh, in, uh, you know, the world of, ubiquitous high-speed computing and a universal uh, data and computing fabric, we can then start to you know, move our computation uh, back and forth uh, and move data back and forth without regard to the sources of friction I mentioned earlier and simply optimize for whatever function concerns us, which might be execution time, total cost. Uh, we might want to trade off uh, economies of scale and how we deliver computing at one location um, at, at the cost of having to move data further, or we want to, might want to compute locally uh, and then uh, just move results to remote locations. Um, and uh, you know, if we go back into history, some of us can remember when we computed over, we moved data over dial-up lines. CRPC, the Center for Research on Parallel Computing, 155 megabits per second was sort of the state of the art. Now we're up to uh, you know, 10 or 100 gigabits per second. We're getting 400 being deployed. Uh, free space optics will be next. Uh, and I was talking this afternoon to, uh, about pure optical, uh, to someone to, about pure optical network uh, cores. And meanwhile, uh, we've got these faster, ever faster components, which I've expressed here in terms of uh, the peak speed of a large central computer, but of course these computers can be essential, increasingly decentralized. Uh, we're just deploying an exascale computer at Argonne National Lab, which will be a major driver for the systems that, that we're working with. Um, so I think it's going to be very interesting seeing what, we, what sort of things we do in this computing continuum uh, going, going uh, forward. Um, so in this com computing continuum, computing can run anywhere. Uh, we want to be able to move computation from one place to another depending on many different factors. Uh, in order to do that, we need what do we need? We need a continuum aware programming abstractions, maybe some way of function as a service might be part of it for saying this is the computation that needs to be performed, this is its uh, uh, cost, performance, maybe uh, latency sensitivity uh, envelope. Um, 
under the covers, we need a way to access data anywhere without regard for uh, issues of uh, protocols and such like. We need a way of computing anywhere, as I've already said, and we need uh, this trust fabric underneath. So you know, we're at the point where we're, we've got a good attempt at a, global, a transfer fabric, a compute fabric, a trust fabric, continu continuum aware programming, which actually was originally the goal of the Seagrads project 20 years ago. Um, still, I think, a bit, a bit of an open problem, but we are certainly seeing that people can express powerful things as these flows, but we want to be far more flexible than that, and perhaps that's the uh, task for the next uh, 20 years or so as we uh, build on, on this underlying uh, fabric. It reminds me a bit of uh, you know, someone uh, saying to me, well, we, the, your thesis proposal for a PhD student often becomes the future work section of your proposal um, at, at the end. So maybe uh, a similar thing, thing here. We've built the fabric now, so we can get on with the, uh, the original proposal, which was to build a universal computer continuum aware uh, programming uh, infrastructure. So I would, wanted to go on to just one last thing and say, what else can we do with a global computing fabric? Um, and uh, this is something that we're spending a lot of time thinking about at Chicago and Argon, and so are others. Um, of course, we can, as I've, I've given several examples of how we can do wonderful things if we can compute anywhere and move data anywhere. We can write programs that do interesting things and do them more efficiently or with data that could previously not be easily integrated, for example, the federated learning example. But in a time of uh, AI, we should also think about what, who is going to be, what is going to be performing these computations. Will they just be programs that we write ourselves, or will we want to increasingly write agents that will perform, decide what computations to perform based on some uh, internal uh, logic or perhaps uh, you know, dis hypothesis generation, hypothesis testing, uh, ideas that they can implement themselves based on hopefully guidance from us, but not without complete human uh, interventions. And so that means we might want to start building various forms of embodied agents. So embodied agent is a term widely used in robotics, but I think it has broader applicability. Um, you know, an embodied agent is some computational system that can interact with its environment and learn from those interactions and learn over time and hopefully improve uh, its behaviors. Uh, in our world, you know, this, well, interacting might mean uh, accessing remote computers, um, accessing remote databases. Uh, you know, the things we interact with could be simulations or therefore representations of some virtual space, or they could be physical uh, entities like uh, computers, robots, uh, or, um, or uh, you know, perhaps laboratory equipment. So, we're very interested in building uh, systems that can apply these sorts of techniques to, to problems of scientific discovery, uh, in fact. So I'll give you, uh, first of all, a couple of cartoons and then a real example. So probably some of you are familiar with uh, large language models. Um, I'm told that in Texas you just call them language models. Is that right? <laughs> no one is laughing. So. Everything's big in Texas, right? So anyway, so, okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, so uh, as you probably know, people are doing increasingly interesting things with large language models. Um, as they keep getting bigger, we keep discovering that they can seem to be able to do things, at least with some degree of reliability, that previously we thought they could not do. Um, uh, and then people are developing techniques for chaining them together so that... Uh, you might discover a way of doing something and then you might actually perform an action which you've also learned about by asking the, land, the language model how to do it and then perform that action. Um, and people are using that, for example, to implement uh, enhanced chat agents. But we can also imagine these uh, things performing things like simulations and, and experiments uh, and, and therefore pursuing perhaps scientific hypotheses. So uh, here's an example of how uh, this is still very much work in progress and a sort of a bit of a cartoon, but we've got various bits of this working. Uh, 
the problem that a colleague of mine, uh, Arvind Ramanathan, again, is interested in is designing antimicrobial peptides. So these are small, uh, smallish molecules, you know, chains of amino acids that uh, can, can sometimes be, if designed appropriately, can, uh, can uh, interfere with the actions of bacteria or viruses or other pathogens. Uh, and if designed well, they also don't interfere with the functioning of the human or other uh, cells that you want it to attack the pathogen uh, of, uh, if you like. So, so here's a, you know, a simple example of an of a embodied agent that we're developing. So you've got a set of, perhaps initially a set of peptides as input. These are candidates. Um, then you're going to go off and uh, query uh, a large online database called PubMed uh, and ask about ways that you might uh, perhaps create that peptide. Uh, and then you might, uh, um, you might ask another service. You might run uh, AlphaFold, for example, uh, to uh, predict uh, the ways that a particular peptide might act on a particular uh, entity. Um, and then you might uh, getting uh, perhaps now a subset of the peptides that you found to be appropriate here. You might then do some additional structure computations to decide whether they're uh, effective. And then eventually, um, you've got a set of candidates for experimental evaluation. And then if you look very carefully here, you might see this is a self-driving lab that we have at Argon that will, uh, under the control of similar cloud-hosted services to those I've been describing, can then uh, perform evaluations to decide whether or not uh, a particular peptide, in this case, um, can uh, act against a particular pathogen. So this is, here we've still got, we've got, uh, the humans are providing the set of peptides as inputs, uh, but everything else is automated, and you can certainly imagine uh, coming up with even more powerful hypotheses, if you like. These are pep hypotheses. Um, and uh, interacting with uh, entities that not only, well, some of these, I mean, these are, perhaps this is in Washington, D.C. The AlphaFold perhaps is running at a national supercomputer center. Uh, perhaps the, uh, the structure computation is running somewhere else. The uh, experimental evaluation could be performed, uh, in this case, it's being performed at a national lab. It be, could be performed elsewhere. So we've got a distributed, uh, stateful, reliable, highly secure, we believe, uh, computation that's engaging and accelerating, we hope, scientific uh, discovery. So I think that's uh, pretty, pretty exciting. And it means that we're using language models uh, in our work, which of course is fun for the students and interesting for us. Um, so uh, a final slide. Uh, so uh, it's sort of interesting to think if you sort of like looking at the arc of history. You know, computers started off big mainframe systems and everyone logged into them. And then we, everything was distributed, uh, workstations. And then we went back to cloud computing. Now we seem to be moving to this increasingly distributed environment. Um, and ultimately, I think we'll arrive at this computing continuum where the only thing, as I said, that determines where things happen is uh, these trade-offs between time and uh, or speed and speed and distance, I, I suppose ultimately, and and I suppose cost as well in, in some situations. And in this context, we seem to have solved actually quite a few problems that were problems for distributed computing early on, um, and I list some of them here. But of course, now there's a whole lot of other problems that we uh, need to uh, address. Um, energy being one, we still haven't got a handle on how to handle data space architectures, but that's for another, another discussion, perhaps. Um, and some other questions uh, we could talk about, ranging from the economics of future computing systems uh, to uh, algorithmic design. And I still hope that we'll be able to integrate quantum sensors and quantum networks and quantum computers into these, uh, into these fabrics so that we can take advantage of the accelerated acceleration that we hope to get from quantum computing once it becomes uh, uh, available. So thanks very much for your attention. And uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here.
Um, thank you so much. Uh, let's see if you've got a few questions. So, Ian, your, your work is kind of a, a technical tour de force to make this happen. So what I wanted to ask about was something you commented about in the middle of your talk, which was friction, mm -hmm. which is organizations create friction. Yep. And so I'm not sure how the, the Globus compute model is sort of set up. Like, so for the people that are using the Argon beamline, yeah. are they sending the compute back to their home institutions where they have resources, or do they use like NSF access credits or something to send it to those systems, or how, how does everybody agree on whose compute they'll host and how much of it? Yes, uh, so it's all of the above, and uh, I think um, that's, you know, so it's interesting. So, you know, data, of course, has a whole different set of concerns because usually everyone agrees to provide networks for other people, uh, in, a, in a sense. And, and there are natural, also, uh, best effort protocols that allow for oversubscription and, and so forth, um, or overuse and, and back off. It, computing is more difficult. Um, I think we'll, uh, the, this is, the scientific community is still trying, working out, I think, well, how much computing do you need to provide to, oh, this is a more general, how much computing do we need in our lives to enable the services that we want? You know, so our cars are full of computers. Um, uh, the Tesla has even more computers than, and, and that, I guess, is viewed as uh, an adequate, uh, and a necessary thing to provide. Um, how, much, how many computers do we need in our um, scientific environments or our factories or our homes? Um, once we come up with an answer to that, then we can then come up with strategies, and maybe that's where these programming model issues arise that will allow us to make sensible trade-offs between what we do in different situations, depending how much computing is available. That doesn't really answer your question, but it speaks to some aspects of it. So uh, I guess maybe just to be a little bit more specific, yeah. so where are some of these computations being hosted today? Is it Do, yeah. do you have sort of a a set of, of benefactors who are willing to say, hey, you can run the Globus Compute st stuff on, oh, yeah. on our system, and we've got like two racks set aside for yeah. that, and you know, we're not going to worry about the cost for now, or? Well, so the, the advanced photon <laughs> source, for example, which I know a lot about, the, it's a mix of um, central compute facilities funded by a Department of Energy, because it's viewed as important um, to enhance the value of these instruments. Uh, and then embedded computers within instruments at individual beamlines that often run machine learning models that have been trained on the central computers. And getting to that situation is, I mean, it's been a work of many years, not by me, but by others. You know, initially, people assumed that computing was a, you know, it was an activity left to their, it was a, what, you, what did Cheney once say? It was a private virtue. You know, like about recycling. You know, you, mm -hmm. the state shouldn't pay for it. Um, but here, I think DOE realized they needed to pay for some amount of computing. But other places, I know you have a wonderful, well, you have a fairly wonderful computing environment here, and presumably it's going to become even more wonderful. Uh, and that will be because at some point your uh, institution realizes you have to invest in this computing power if you, you want your scientists to be competitive. Hi. Uh, my question is about the global computers, Globus Compute as well. Yeah. So is the vision of Globus Compute similar to like data transfer where every laptop or every supercomputer can have that Globus Compute node in it yes. and we can just run anywhere we want to eventually? Well, we can, we've made it uh, sort of a, in a way that speaks to the first question uh, also. We've made it trivial to compute anywhere, but the, store, the question is who is allowed to compute places, um, and you probably don't want um, you know, just anyone running on your laptop. But if you wanted to be able to distribute a computation across the computers you have access to, that it would become very easy to, easy to do that. But yeah, the question still arises of who's allowed to do, do what. Thank you.
some people will say we've got to, we want to, I want to close my institution's borders and not let any computation in. And other people will say, let them come. So it'll be interesting to see how it works out. Hi. I'd like to ask a practical question. When you use the word global, how global is it? Is it between yeah. nation or, but then if that's the case, different government has different policy and the security it become an issue. And yes, if right. it's within the United States, wouldn't you call it a national instead of global? As a matter of fact, a lot of bigger corporations already are doing this. Uh -huh. So how would this method better? Yeah, no, it's a too good question. So, um, first of all, I, you know, I, I, every now and then I look at, well, we look at the Globus usage, and I think I've seen endpoints in, in mostly transfer rather than compute, but most, uh, still uh, in, I think, 153 countries. So there are people using it on a global scale. Uh, there are certainly, I don't, there's very little usage in China, mostly because the global firewall of China prevents us accessing the management logic. Um, there are other countries probably where the lack of local networking making makes it difficult, but in general it can be deployed and used uh, uh, in, anywhere. Uh, the question of you know how this differs from say, uh, well, what would be, of course, companies often uh, of course run global networks. Um, I think the there are some th things that distinguish. We tend to say that we're working, building these services for science, although there's nothing arguably science-specific about them. But uh, science does have this particular pattern of often loose and fluid uh, organizational structures. And therefore, security protocols that, for example, let you easily delegate the right to do something to a remote uh, entity um, become very important. While if you're, say, Intel with well, maybe I don't know if Intel is a good example or not, but you know you've got 20 computing centers worldwide. You can control exactly who has access to them. Um, you have a, a list of authorized users. So simpler solutions uh, are effective in, in those situations. I had one last question. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, you were talking about lots of different applications. So yeah. I think one thing you kind of seen as a function yeah. of time is some of the stuff becoming closer to yeah. happening in real time. Yeah. Like what what are the applications that you think are like you might even have to just discontinue because it's too easy or it, it's like uh, this isn't a priority for us. Oh, I that's a that's another fascinating question. The issue of real time I just makes yeah. me think of an anecdote. Uh, we, we one of the early applications we worked on a long time ago was a remote operation of earthquake engineering uh, experiments. But I remember the, uh, the earthquake engineers were very unhappy with us because we said the best we can do for latency between Chicago and uh, San Diego is 60 milliseconds. Because um, they, I guess they weren't, they hadn't done the bit of, or well, they'd forgotten the bit of their physics class where the speed of light was, uh, was covered, right? So yeah, so, so there always will be obstacles that will make things difficult. So, well, I mean, I think, you know, some things with the cloud, uh, on the one hand, and then some in the, you know, the more distributed settings, some of the things we're doing and others are doing. Uh, you know, computing remotely is used to be a real uh, challenge and is now something that's become pretty trivial. So that's a technical problem that's uh, become easier. But now we're going to we start challenging, taking on far more you know, interesting applications. You know, so this you know building something. Like this, which yeah. you know, we, in a sense, it's just an example. It's not, but you know, and as a computational we, biologist, I love yeah. this. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, a bit, you know, we had a, uh, we wanted to put something together for a proposal, I think, or a talk, and so you know, someone in a week quickly put this together, and uh, you know, that would have been a PhD thesis or multiple PhD theses, uh, just a, a few years ago. So. This is another goal. This what? Is merely within a yeah, yeah, so in this case, in this case, I guess it's global. We're running at several different institutions and we're using remote databases. Uh, so it's, um, it's, in this case, everything is within the United States, but other applications span, uh, span countries. So I don't think we should, we should call it, we want to go beyond the Earth into space. So we're not stopping it global, right? Galaxy. Should, there you go, raise the stakes, yeah. <laughs> 
But then we have longer latency, con con greater latency concerns. Yeah, we can invest, yes, yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so um, much, yeah.